Summer 2020 Webinar Series, Technology Supports for Blind and Low Vision Students, sponsored by the California Department of Education Clearinghouse for Specialized Media and Technology. To be able to bring to you this series of webinars uh, <clears throat> developed and presented by Ting, Dr. Ting. And uh, I think most of you know Ting, but Ting is um, a great leader within um, accessibility and education for students, and so we're very excited to have her. So with this, let me go ahead and introduce you to your presenter, Dr. Ting. Okay. Thank you, Jen. And hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on your summer break. I realize everybody's on vacation or um, slipping in this in between other things, so I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, there are captions, just the live ones from PowerPoint, um, but this will be recorded and on the recording there will be um, better captions with the recording. So just so everybody knows, this is being recorded and it will be posted on the CSMT website um, and you will have that link. And um, Jen, as Jen mentioned, there's also going to be um, questions in the chat. If you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the chat box, um, she will be gathering the, the questions. We'll do a Q&A doc, and that will also be posted on the, the website. Uh, so just wanted to welcome everybody to how to conduct a needs assessment. Uh, today, we're going to talk about workflow design and implementation. And this is um, a continuation of what we talked about last week about the three C's of a digital workflow where we covered um, how to capture, convert, and put materials into the cloud for our students. So just, uh, just wanted to review for anybody who missed last week. Um, we've got a couple of workshop norms, so we just ask that you please stay muted. Um, if there's time for questions at the end, um, I'd be happy to entertain some questions, but just in case we don't get to that, um, again, please put that in the Q&A. Um, if you just Google um, California CDE, California Department of Education, CSMT webinars, you'll find the, the web, web link to where the recordings and the Q&A docs will be posted later. Um, also, just remember that the most fun part about technology is that technology fails. And it's all about the workarounds and backup systems that matter. Um, this is good to remember for our own practice so we don't get frustrated. We pass it on to our students. Um, but also, in case my internet drops out, I will be right back. So don't leave. <laughs> and um, uh, just at the end of the day, let's just have fun with this. Uh, I love talking about tech, and um, I hope that we can just have a, have a fun time in the next hour together. So today, um, I designed this presentation so that we can talk about the basics of how to capture a blind or low vision student's technology needs. Um, this is a really big part of how to figuring out technology instruction for our students. Where do we begin? And it all begins with what do our students need? Um, part of capturing those needs and being able to address them is also figuring out how to design and implement a digital workflow that's going to work for each student. And yeah, it might look a little bit different depending on each student and where they are. So we're going to go through some tools to do that later. And then finally, once we've got the workflow set up, we need to think about how we're going to set up or scale up our students' digital literacy skills so that they can be successful in the workflow and then um, address these needs that we've identified for their learning. So um, if you need a review on the digital workflow, um, that recording should be posted on the website uh, very soon. So, um, okay, so let's just jump right into it. Let's get started. And we are gonna um, just uh, walk our way through this content today. Okay, so um, earlier this year, I published a book with Ike Presley. Um, it's called Access Technology for Blind and Low Vision Accessibility. It's available from the American Printing House for the Blind, APH. And um, this content we're talking about today, it's really just beginning information. There's no way to like fully um, learn and become an expert in this in just a one hour presentation. Um, so I wanted to point to chapter eight of my book so that if you wanted to go back and study this content a little bit more, um, maybe read about it, about it in more depth, um, I'd recommend chapter eight for that. Okay, so first things first, we've got the needs assessment. Um, 
The needs assessment template is one of the appendix items in the book. And it's a very, very simple form. It's just, you know, on a, something I've done on a Word document and I've kind of revised over the years. And I've personally used this to figure out um, what a student's needs are for technology. Um, this needs assessment isn't meant to be um, a comprehensive evaluation tool. Rather, I think of it sort of like um, uh, a data organizer um, so that I can take all that rich data I've got from my functional vision assessment, my FBA. I can take all that rich information from my LMA, the learning media assessment, and I can plug it in so that um, it lays out in such a way that the needs for technology can kind of like bubble up from there. Um, I also like to lay out this information so I have a very clear idea what a student's sensory access needs are. I think a lot of times we get our FBA and LMA data and there's so much information that we get um, that it's hard to distill that into um, how it connects directly to those technology recommendations. Um, so you know, we're just plugging in that information differently so we can see how those sensory access needs fit into technology. We can identify some areas for improving a student's independence or work efficiency. So this is going to help us prioritize our instruction. Um, so where can we make the biggest impact where it's going to have the biggest domino effect on all the areas of a student's learning and access. And then finally, with all this information, um, it can help you identify the technology features that would benefit a student. And, um, I know that there are some of my former students in this webinar today, and uh, for anybody who has attended any of my talks or has had me in class, everybody knows that I tend to... Yeah, there's big trucks. Like, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, I, people know that I tend to... Sell that sense. I'm really relying on technology features. So this is a really important... Um, part of this process of identifying a student's needs because if we very quickly and too quickly jump to identifying a certain product or a certain brand or like a specific device for a student, we're automatically kind of like putting that student's uh, toolbox into a very small locked box. But when we can focus on the features of technology that would benefit a student, um, we have wide open options. You've got options from mainstream tech, options from other areas of AT that maybe weren't built for a blind and low vision student, but could still be very, very successful for a student. Um, also, you know, a, a tool or a device that might work for a student at the beginning of the school year might not work as well as the student's needs change or the classroom changes or you know, you move from a physical classroom to a virtual classroom. Or maybe it's just the technology dies one day or the technology breaks, you're waiting for a loaner or you gotta swap something out, or sometimes something even better comes out. So you wanna have that flexibility to be able to swap a student's tools in and out of their toolbox without being out of compliance, but also maintaining that like flexibility to be able to do that, okay? Um, Right. And I apologize, I keep looking up because I just noticed there's a spider on my ceiling right above my, my computer. So I just want to make sure the spider doesn't drop down on me while I'm talking. Uh, so let's just hope it stays up there. Uh, okay, so um, I want to take you through the needs assessment template. Uh, this is appendix item 9.4 in the AT book, okay? Um, and I just put a little Microsoft Word icon in the middle of the slide here as a prompt to open up the actual document. Um, let's see. And I must apologize for Vance for anybody who does need captions in the audience here. Um, when I stop the screen share and I instead share the Microsoft Word, I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose my captions. Um, so I'll just give a little description of what I'll be doing, okay? So when I open the template, you'll see that this template has already been filled out, okay? This has been filled out by a student's TVI and o and -er. They've done it um, together collaboratively, which I think is really great because then you really see the whole scope of a student's needs in different environments. And um, I just wanted to walk you through the needs assessment. I'll be reading out the information out loud on, on the document. And um, you can just read along as I read out the text. And as we read through the text, I want you to think about um, how this might 
um, define your instructional priorities, okay? And then we'll pop back onto this PowerPoint and we'll talk through some of the information that was on the template. And um, what I'm trying to do with this is basically download my thinking to share how I would take this information to um, get starting points for instruction, okay? So here we go. I'm gonna stop this share. And I've got my Microsoft Word document set up. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, you guys. So as I mentioned, this was completed by the current TVI and O&M instructor. So an FBA, LMA, has already been done. You've already got that FEA and LMA information to then um, parse that information and put it into this form. So we're looking at a needs assessment for a student we'll call Kevin. Um, at the time this was filled out, um, Kevin is about seven and a half years old. He's just finished first grade. He's going into second grade. And this is a kiddo who's in a full inclusion gen ed classroom. So, First of all, I wanna take a step back and think about, well, why would I go through the trouble of completing this form? Um, yeah, and who would I do this for? So I have done this for students where maybe I feel overwhelmed by the amount of needs there are. Um, there's just so many student needs. Um, and let me just type out what I'm saying here. Why or when would I, this out. So maybe it's a new student and I want to ask people who know the student to get more info, okay? It might be um, a student with so many needs it's hard to know where to begin. Um, maybe it's a situation where there's too many moving pieces. Um, and also, don't know where to begin. So we're starting to see this theme here where it's hard to know where to begin because it can just seem like there's so much going on. Um, so this helps me reset. So just to give everybody a little background information and, um, you know, when I give myself this background information, this is just um, diagnosis. So Kevin is diagnosed with Lieber congenital amaurosis. He has 20 over 1200 acuity and he has experienced gradual loss over the years with no color vision. He's a super bright kid. He's curious, fearless, sociable makes friends readily. He can be silly. He's got great focus and stamina when engaged with something, knows what he wants and likes, and wants to participate in what peers are doing. This is awesome. So you've got some incentive here, right? We know what's going to motivate this kid. Okay, he navigates well in familiar environments independently. So he does the cane, he does trailing, he had o and since preschool, but he was led around in school prior to this year. So um, he basically just finished his first year in a new school this past year. Um, Kevin uses listening, braille, and tactile graphics to access school curriculum. However, he is not interested or unable to access pictures and books. Okay, and I really love how this um, team identified he's not interested slash unable because sometimes these two end up presenting similarly, but it is um, you know, important to remember that sometimes when a student is not interested, it's possibly because it's been difficult or they haven't had good access. So that leads them to become uninterested. So a lot of our job is getting students to be interested again by providing better access. Okay, Kevin has um, also has had extensive and good braille instruction in preschool and kindergarten, but unfortunately it was not used in the classroom. Instead, in the past, he had an aide who scribed or drew his answers on print lessons 
And this past school year was his first classroom experience with using accommodated or adapted lessons. So this is so awesome. Kevin is assigned a variety of chores at home. He is involved with a range of extracurriculars. He does piano, nice, so do I, or at least I did. Uh, guitar, hiking, roller skating, dot, dot, dot. Uh, he's probably got skateboarding as future as well. Um, he's a very engaged, and he has very engaged, knowledgeable, and supportive parents. Um, and this is pretty much like all the background information we need, right? I mean, if people want more information, it's in the, the comprehensive evaluation report. But remember, this needs assessment is kind of our own internal exercise to help us figure out our um, instructional priorities. So if you're not sharing this with anybody else, you might not need to do this paragraph, but it's just a good summary of the kid, right? Um, so just to give a little background, um, this is a student who's new to me and I just want to get a better sense of the student and get a better, you know, lay of the land um, to figure out my instructional priorities when I go see him. So in this section, student sensory learning channels, we're going to break down um, that LMA info to get very, very specific and more detailed information in a very clear way how a student uses different senses for learning. So the team has identified Kevin's primary learning channel as auditory, okay. So on the forum, it asks for a person to list the tasks the student can do efficiently using this sense. So with the auditory sense, Kevin can follow the teacher instructions if it's clear. So for example, on the rug, in a classroom, during transitions, okay during PE and movement and dance instructions. Once it's learned and he's partnered with a buddy, uses the auditory sense very well. Okay, when focused, he has great auditory memory. This is really good too, because if we know that he's got good auditory memory already, um, we can work with that. And it'll also help him reduce the cognitive load in processing information auditorily if we know that he's really good with this. Okay, he also has really great auditory um, use for accessing classroom recorded books and at home and for identifying staff and peers. Great. Now, just as important, we went through the tasks the student can do efficiently with a sense, but it's also very important to know what are the tasks with limited success using the sense, because when auditory is not the most efficient for the student, we've got to make sure he's got another very well-developed sensory learning channel to pick up the difference and um, be uh, the, the stronger sense in that case. So tasks with limited success using the sense, um, videos, group projects, using the iPad with voiceover. Does not want an adult doing audio description for him. Okay, so this is a kid who's super independent and we are gonna use that. Okay, sometimes locating where to transition to in a classroom. And I can imagine this can be challenging if the classroom is very busy or if the instructions are not clear. Okay, moving vehicles. Great. So some of these, you know, this is a really nice way to also get like a present levels too, because some of these things, this is like presently he's having um, difficulty using auditory access for videos. But we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's because is it limited experience with having audio description for videos? Is it that his videos don't have audio description? So this is something that I might want to get more information on. Um, and I'm just kind of going to keep that in the back of my mind. Okay. So this is the primary learning channel auditory. Let's move along and let's see what the team has identified to be the student's secondary learning channel. Just going to scroll up a little bit. Sorry for any uh, motion sickness here. Okay, so for the student's secondary learning channel, we've got tactile, which makes sense because this is a kid where in the background we saw that he's got Liebers with 20 over uh, 2100 um, acuity. Um, so tasks the student can do efficiently using the sense. Great. We are, and I always like to start with what works because um, I think when we also can identify the strengths of a student these are our jumping off points. We're always gonna start off with the student's strengths and what they can do very well. So tactile, 
Um, the student uses his tactile sense very well for reading Braille, writing on the Perkins Braille writer and putting paper in, taking it out, navigating the page, correcting mistakes. Um, he uses his tactile sense to do classroom art projects independently using tactile paper and glue with a model or instructions. He's very good at using his tactile sense for locating or putting away personal school items, binders, books, etc., from his desk, over chair cubby, holder, cubby, listening center, reading bookcase. ADL, okay, great. For meals, bathroom, cleaning up, backpack, cook, really good sensory guy. Um, getting around campus independently with his cane, awesome. Playing with Legos and other free time stuff, great. So I like to, I, I love hearing that he likes to work with his hands. Doing chores at home, of course. We love when children are nice little chore workers at home, right? Um, he's uh, working on the abacus, um, using his tactile sense to figure out coins, completing adaptive braille and tactile lessons and worksheets independently, uh, using raised line graph paper and stickers for tracking and uh, for tracking math game stores, how fun. And finally, using a signature guide to print his name for our projects. And I really love that the team included this here because, you know, for all of our kids, whether they're print or braille readers, it is still important for all students to have a sense of what print is like and what it looks like. Um, because we have so many references to print letters in our world. So I, I just really appreciate that the team put this in there. So that's great. Okay, and then what are some of the things that aren't so hot using the tactile sense? Okay, general scissor skills, especially cutting more complex items, says that he uses left-handed scissors, um, paper clipping and stapling. Okay, so some of those paper handling skills. Okay, this is a good, good thing to keep in mind. Um, organizing papers and task tools, putting into and taking out of three ring binders or folders, keeping tools and papers in designated trays or desk space. I have to admit, I actually have a hard time with this as well. Um, but thinking about this, I might want to double check that he understands the idea of folders um, because having physical folders and being able to organize things there, that's going to translate to having virtual folders and keeping files organized in that format too, right? Okay. Um, learning to access the iPad with voiceover and navigating a grid format. Okay, so it does sound like he's still learning that virtual environment. Um, okay, um, using the slate and stylus, keyboarding. Okay, he's a little guy going to second grade, so um, this, is, uh, this is nice to see on the list, so it's definitely something we're going to work on. Uh, navigating a busy cap cafeteria, playground and garden, dropped items, tactile maps. Okay, now the third tertiary learning channel, visual. So what are the tasks a student can do efficiently using the sense? He can navigate in classroom and hallways, but he sometimes bumps into things, okay? So it sounds like he's got some gross orientation ability with his visual sense. And identifying staff and peers. This is interesting, because I remember that also he could identify staff and peers very well with his auditory sense. And then tasks with limited success using a sense, um, watching videos, group projects, and identifying colors, because he wants to know the colors of things and use specific colors for art. So this was a very, very specific and detailed list of things, um, different things that he um, could accomplish with different um, senses, okay? And this is really good because this is gonna link directly to what types of features of technology he needs because if you see, if you scroll up and you look at his auditory access and you look at the types of tasks he does well, then you can think about, okay, well, what kind of technology would support having access to recorded books? Um, what kind of technology would, um, you know, really emphasize his strength with having that good auditory memory and being able to listen to directions? So already I'm thinking, Okay, maybe screen reader, okay, if he's really strong in auditory, okay. Um, but limited success, again, video, I'm not sure, but maybe the recommendation would be he needs um, audio description video with videos. Um, you know, using the iPad with voiceover, this could just be a, a training thing. So definitely, like, I'm thinking this kid would really benefit from some screen reader because he's got really great auditory access skills, okay. 
And again, we're really focused on what are the student's strengths because we're going to figure out what technology is going to maximize those strengths. Okay. So in the secondary learning channel with tactile, the student's a braille reader. Great. Automatically, I'm thinking he's going to need a he's going to have a need a braille display. I'm not specifying which brand yet, but he will benefit from a Braille display to get quicker and more independent access to Braille and to more Braille, okay? Um, okay, so ADL, he's got um, good tactile skills there. Obviously O&M, he's using the cane, that's great. Um, we're gonna make sure that when he's doing chores in ADL, everything's got some good um, tactile markers on them. Um, because, you know, we all understand as well, sometimes no tech is the best tech, right? Um, okay, and then, you know, some organization skills, okay? So, let's see, that might be some no tech items, just organizational trays, um, as the teacher's already mentioned here. Um, slate stylus, keyboarding, okay? So, we definitely have to make sure that whatever he's working on, he's got a QWERTY keyboard, but also a six key, key entry keyboard for Braille, if he's also a savvy Braille kid. Um, and then for visual, you know, I'm thinking, okay, he wants to be able to identify color, so I'm thinking, okay, some technology that would do color identification. And that's all I'm gonna say, color identification, because I'm not gonna say he needs a specific device for color identification. I'm not gonna specify a specific app, but he's just gonna need something that's gonna give him that color identifier. And we're gonna figure out later whether it's an app or a standalone device or, um, you know, just, you know, ask a person if your tech isn't there, but we're just putting down that feature to identify colors, okay? And it also looks like he does a fair amount of group projects. So we're also gonna think about um, what kind of technology is gonna allow him to do collaborative work with typically sighted peers. Okay, so already my brain's kind of looking at the different senses, how he accesses information, and trying to fit what kind of technology is going to support that. Okay, the next section of the needs assessment form is to identify the classroom, school, and community activities that the student currently requires assistance to engage in and has the potential to be more independent. So um, these are really identifying what are going to be the maximum impact areas for instruction. So if this is kid especially is very pro independence, he wants to be able to do things on his own, these are going to identify where you're going to target instruction. Okay, so where can I target instruction so it is the most impactful? because it's gonna make the biggest difference in this kid's life if we can move him from being dependent on sighted assistance to more independent or to be able to better dictate how and when he gets assistance, okay? So any sort of partner activities, it looks like he um, is really dependent on staff to model the interaction for the peers, for how peers need to interact with him. So we gotta make sure the tech is gonna be very inclusive and collaborative. Gardening, science, art, and some classroom activities, accessing online instruction, um, activities on the playground, and PE games, so phys ed games. Okay, and then the next part is what are the types of non-adapted educational materials and instructional media that the student needs to access in various classes, labs, and electives? And we've got like, okay, what, what's the stuff in his life, okay? What is it that he needs to access? So in language arts, the teachers did a really great job here identifying the specific apps that are in language arts, posters that are around the room, journals, worksheets, flip chart, demonstration, instruction, and reading buddies. Um, in the STEAM area, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, they've got videos, science experiments, science text, art class, apps, math games, art projects. So this is the stuff that we gotta make sure the kid is able to access. This section defines what are the accessible educational materials, AEM, that we are um, responsible for supporting, okay? And the teachers also um, listed what's included in the distance learning, so different apps that the school and classroom teachers might be learning. Okay, and then based on all that information, this is a section that gets really fun, um, where you could start listing out the technology features that would benefit the student. Um, so a couple of the things here, 
a computer and tablet um, to be able to work online, obviously. Um, screen reader, braille display, keyboarding. He needs to have an audio player for books or an app or some sort of access to um, digital talking books, okay? Tactile graphics, um, color identification, maybe sound devices for PE, digital worksheets or files and books. And I'm thinking with tactile graphics here, maybe um, 3D models when tactile graphics aren't around or even um, having image description or also known as alt text for, for images, okay? And then um, the final section of, form, the, of the form is a section for you to identify what are some potential constraints or challenges of implementing technology in this student's environment. So these are gonna be different, but these are just sort of like, okay, these are the things I need to be aware of that I might need to overcome that are gonna be constraints, not necessarily due to the student, but more related to like where the student is. And this kind of segues us to the digital workflow planning tool because we have to have a really good understanding of what the student's environment is and what are the constraints that they're working with. Like, are they in a house or a school with like bad Wi-Fi that drops off? Um, what are the teachers using? And sometimes it's hard, um, it can be, you might not, know what information you need until you get there and then you're like oh shoot i wish i had known that the school was going to be using this platform or that platform and i would have planned for it better you know um so luckily um in the book there is another form for that because i don't know about you guys but sometimes i walk into um sometimes i walk into a room and i'm i'm just like okay i gotta do this i gotta do that but then i walk out of the room and i remember what I forgot to get. It's kind of like going to the store without a shopping list. Um, so let me bring up this digital workflow planning form. And this is a way to help you capture all those pieces in an environment that is good to be aware of so you can plan for it. So this is uh, something developed by Jessica McDowell. It's also in the textbook. Um, and so here's just an area for that quick summary of the FBA and LMA information. Here's a checklist, okay, of what a student currently uses. So just different things to check off, okay? And then when you talk about what's, what do I need to plan for to make a digital workflow happen, um, it's what, what are the classroom technologies that are being used? So here are the notes on general technology use. So does the student use email, Google Chrome, or Drive, or Do Docs, or Dropbox? What are other cloud and note-taking or storage options? Uh, what devices, applications, and learning management systems, LMS, are used school-wide or in specific classes? So, um, the student, uh, I mean, the team had actually listed this on the needs assessment. So, you know, some of the things here, I think it was like Seesaw was one, I remember. Um, other places might use Schoology. These are all examples of LMSs, okay? So this is where you would just list this, and this is where you would need to be able to identify um, some supports for accessibility. If you know a student is, or a student's classroom is going to be using any of these applications, then your automatic next step is, how will my student access this? Or how will our student access this? Okay, it really becomes um, a, 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 a shared responsibility with the classroom, but also the school to make sure that every student can access these uh, technologies. And then um, when we talk about implementing the digital workflow, you know, think about what are the tasks and activities do we think technology could be an efficient tool for? And this is where we can reference back to your needs assessment tool um, to look at what are those tasks and activities that the student is currently very dependent on sighted assistance for, okay? So this is just another way to cut the cheese, uh, so to speak. Um, and I just like, you know, to have different ways for you to organize your information and you can use whatever works best for you. Um, but this form is also nice because it does also identify the roles of the team here. So how are all the different people in the IEP team going to support the student? And 
here, this is also very important. What are the training and or support needed? Okay, this is part of IDEA. Districts must provide training for staff who need to support a student. So this means you have got legs to advocate for supports to go to professional development that is relevant to you and your students' needs, okay? Um, I know oftentimes it can be very hard to get released from districts to go to a conference. Um, and you know, if a, if a district um, won't send you to a conference, then you've got to really insist that they can provide it for you in-house um, because this is an obligation under IDEA, okay? Um, this is something that we can and must advocate for to keep up with our professional development. And then finally, you know, remembering that we've got the capture of a student's needs for now. We're doing instruction for now, but we're always planning for the future. So what are the future considerations and recommendations for future IEP planning? Okay. All right, so let me stop this share and I'm gonna jump back onto our PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so we looked at the needs assessment tool. We looked at the digital workflow planning tool. Okay, and this really helps uh, to identify a student's infrastructure, identify needed training or support, and identify future considerations. So we looked at that form. And with all this information now, what are some considerations for student-led technology instruction? Um, number one, first and foremost, um, we've got to define and prioritize a task for instruction. So in order to do that, we have to have a good sense of, well, what motivates the student? What will best enable a student's participation in the classroom, but not just participation, but leadership among peers? I think it's really, it's just as important to provide our students access as it is to provide them the tools and skills to be leaders among their peers, because it's only when they have these leadership opportunities that our students can be seen as equals in their learning community. Like with any good teaching, um, we're always gonna build on a student's prior experiences too. So we always encourage students to reflect on what worked and what didn't. And we're gonna reflect on this together. And especially when we talk about tech, this is something that we have to do together because it's a learning experience for us too as well. We have to figure out okay, what worked here, but what can I optimize? What can I make better? And this is part of that diagnostic teaching part too um, that goes along throughout the year. And then you've got you know, your big triennial evaluation or comprehensive evaluation where you really look at what's working and what's not. Um, but anyways, it's just part of diagnostic teaching. Um, and I know sometimes you know, with all the overwhelming tech and stuff that we have to do, um, it can just seem so overwhelming. So I really encourage you guys to stay focused on the goal of access to information. So we are really there to promote students access to information in their classroom environment, in their community environment. And that information could be curricular materials. It could be text, books, images, video. It could be environmental information, but there all, there's all sorts of information. And when we talk about just access to information, this requires a lot of literacies. Um, there's your traditional literacy of just reading and writing, but there's a literacy of how do I work with information? How do I synthesize information? How do I analyze it? And when we throw technology into the mix, um, we can think of this as a digital literacy. So in chapter 10 of the book, um, I talk a little bit more about digital literacy and how can we support students' development of digital literacy. Um, so I wanted to just share a couple considerations when we're thinking about this for our students. Number one, uh, do you guys remember from that needs assessment, there was that one section where uh, Kevin had some challenges using scissors um, and keyboarding and maybe even just swiping um, to use his gestures on the iPad to, to move around. Um, ROT becomes a very important partner in this process. So a lot of our students might have, have um, you know, uh, weaker fine motor skills than other students, remembering that especially kids 
who are born congenitally blind or with low vision, um, they don't tend to have a lot of those same exploratory movements and uh, experiences that develop those little fine motor skills. So oftentimes our students need some intervention with fine motor skills so that they're able to move around with their tech and be able to plug things in and find the little button. Um, you know, do the pinch and spread on a screen, or if you're working with um, gestures on a screen uh, with a screen reader running, doing controlled taps. So doing a single tap, multiple tap, being able to do a split tap where you hold one finger and then tap with the other, um, scrolling and swiping with single versus multiple fingers, being able to hold down multiple keys for key commands. Um, all of these require very good fine motor skills. And so if a student needs intervention in this area, they absolutely might need some consult with OT, okay? I know districts can be a little bit stingy with OT, so you really need to justify the need for OT or at least request that OT evaluation if you're finding that a student's fine motor skills are impeding their ability to um, work with the technology that they need. Okay, another thing um, to consider is students really benefit from some orientation to connect their physical and virtual environments. So if you think about, um, you know, that example of Kevin being a little disorganized with his folders and files, well, he really actually needs to understand how papers go into a folder, just like how files go get saved to a folder online. Um, so I wanted to share this video here from um, A.T. Neal on YouTube or on Twitter. You can find him at Neal underscore A.T. Um, this is such a beautiful tactile graphic that you're going to see. Um, and the tactile graphic um, is, shows the layout of Google Drive. So this is really great to give a tactile graphic of the Google Drive screen, be able to walk through it, have the student put all hands and fingers on it, and really explore how things are laid out so that when the student goes to turn the screen reader on and navigates through Google Drive, they know exactly where they are on the screen because they've got that mental map of where they are in this virtual space. So I'm gonna play this quick video, okay, here we go. 11 by 17 high contrast tactile representation of visual layout of the Google Drive main page as it would look on a computer screen. Pictures in a flash allow all icons and braille labels to be raised and felt in order to accompany a screen reader lesson on Google Drive navigation. Okay, cool. Um, and just so you know, you guys, uh, Neil has done all these on PF, PF. Um, he's created the files in a PDF format so that it can be printed out and then run through a PF machine or a swell machine, if that's what you know it by. Um, he's working on a website where all of these um, PDF files to create uh, tactile graphics on a Swell machine or a PF machine will be available. So he's going to announce the website next Tuesday during our BYOQ. So stay posted. That website is under construction right now. Okay, I have a quick poll for you guys. All right, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to launch this poll, and the question is going to ask you, how many devices have you touched today? So I want you guys to um, pause for a minute, think about from the time you woke up to the time you signed on to this webinar, how many devices you have touched just in today, this, this morning, okay? And you're gonna see a pop-up on the poll. Let's see, and here we go. We're just gonna give this a, a quick 10, a few seconds if you guys wanna Click through and we can, we can see. All right, results are coming in. Over half of you guys have voted. I'm seeing most people two, three, four. Oh, we got like 11% of people who have touched five or more devices. And okay, great. We've got about 70% of votes in. So I'm gonna end the poll, share the results with you guys so you guys can see. All right. Um, okay, of, of the 70% of people who voted, about 28% of people touched two devices, about 30 of you guys touched three devices, 28% touched four devices, and we've got um, a handful, more than a handful of people who touched five or more devices. Okay, now I really want you guys 
to um, think about this, okay? Think about all the devices you have touched today and think about how easily and kind of fluidly you did that, right? Note that nobody touched only one device today, right? Everybody touched multiple devices. Okay, so everybody here touched multiple devices. I gotta ask, why shouldn't our students have the same access to multiple devices in their learning? Um, I kind of wish we were in a room right now just so we could have a show of hands on how many people have encountered pushback um, when requesting more than one device for a student. Well, this is it, okay? Part of supporting our students' digital literacy is making sure that they have access to the multiple devices they will need to be successful in their life, in their learning, and when they transition out of school. All of us have multiple devices that we interact with. Our students need this uh, similar access and they need it even earlier than other kids so that they can develop the proficiency they need to use all the multiple devices. So, okay, on this slide, we've got a graphic. Um, this is one of my favorite all-time graphics um, for scaling up a student's digital literacy skills. Um, this is taken from chapter 10, and this graphic is by um, a, a, a guy, Sasha Casper. Um, you can find him at sasha.casper.com. So it's a line graph. We've got time running along the x-axis. Y axis is labeled experience. And at the beginning of this, uh, we've got a pretty big uptick when people start using technology. And this big uptick, you're like, ooh, new technology, this looks like fun. And then there's a little bit of a dip in um, the line when you realize, ooh, this tech, it's kind of hard. But then you keep with it, right? And then the line shoots up and you're like, you know what, new tech, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm just gonna keep playing it. And you're like, yes, I get it, and you reach this, this false hope moment, right? Where you're like, yes, I know how to, how to manage this tech. And then you're like, ooh, wait, maybe I don't. Oh, maybe I don't know my stuff at all. And then there's a more gradual uptrend where you kind of overcome that learning curve in the technology. And then you're like, ooh, wait, this actually makes sense. And you're like, oh my God, did I do that? And then finally we get to this apex of the graph. We're like, yes, I did it. I did it with technology. I won technology. And so just as we have this learning curve with technology, our students have this learning curve too. Um, and it's part of our job to, you know, kind of help them navigate this, this ship um, and help them ramp up their skills, their digital literacy skills, so that by the time they get to third grade, when you know high stakes computer-based testing begins students have actually already reached this high point of i did it with technology and now they can just focus on the test okay so if you think about students needing to have pretty good tech proficiency by the time they're testing using technology and they need to know their tech well enough to not even think about the tech you really need to backtrack that right and backtrack that enough so that the students have the time to overcome all these little curves and bumps in their technology learning so that they can test well and learn well without thinking about the technology. Okay, so how does that happen? We've got 10 minutes to answer that question, you guys. Um, so in the book, in chapter 10, I have a little sidebar called Let's Talk About Tsunamis. And um, I really like the sidebar. It's, it's taken from one of my own students um, that I um, have been working with. And it's a low vision kid where, you know, I started working with him in first grade. Um, and I just describe the process that we went through in scaling up his, his digital literacy skills. So step number one, introduce tech as soon as possible, but only incidentally and only for fun. So this first step is when a kid, you just introduce the tech and you're like, kid, just play. We're just gonna play with what information you can access here. I'm gonna give you some low tech and high tech tools, but we're literally just playing. We're pushing buttons, seeing what it will read, what information can you get access to, just playing, no, no, no stress, okay? And we're all having fun. Step two is now that you've played with the information and kind of like played with what devices can do, is to develop the student's sensory channels for learning. 
So this is like, okay, now we're gonna work on your listening skills. What do you actually hear with this device? Or what do you feel with this? Um, or what do you see when you're using this sort of low vision uh, device or a high contrast app? And we're still playing, but now we're playing with the sensory access modes, okay? So we play with the tech, play with the senses, and now I'm gonna use diagnostic teaching. I'm gonna take a step back and observe how the student is playing so then I can determine what are the, the related ECC needs. Like, okay, do I need to um, do some more targeted intervention with fine motor skills? Do I need to do some more targeted lessons to develop those listening skills? Um, or, um, you know, like what are those ECC needs? Is it sensory efficiency? Is it those social skills? What's going to, what, what do I need to target now, okay? Because once I know what to target, um, the next step is introducing tasks that you're gonna experiment with, with the student. So now that the student has played with the device, played with how to listen or look or feel, I might introduce, okay, well, let's try reading a recipe now, or let's try reading a book. And how, how does the tech fit in order to read a book? Or what are the different ways I can read a book? Um, with my second grader, who I, I started with first grade, or finished second grade, he's going to third grade now. Um, by the end of first grade, he was able to identify five different ways of reading um, using a variety of no tech, low tech, and high tech. So I could say, hey kid, tell me, what are five different ways you can read? And he'd say, I could use a highlighter, I can use um, you know, a, a ruler, I can use my document camera, I can use my magnifier, um, I can use um, the text-to-speech on my iPad, great. So in second grade, we talked about, well, what are the five different ways I can write? And now we're experimenting with different workflows for how do I write, how do I accomplish that task? And then he said, you know, let's say, well, I can use my, my, my dark pen, I can use markers, I can use crayons, I can use my QWERTY keyboard, and I can use dictation. Um, and it's awesome, because this is what we need a kid to think about, is just having that flexibility, right? Um, because we're building this foundation for future success. So then I'm gonna finally define, what does interdependence mean for the student? So when am I gonna expect him to be fully independent and using what tools? And when and how can he ask for assistance when he needs it? And this also involves the student too, because I think a big part of um, figuring out this needs assessment and future planning is we've got to engage students in their own IEP and planning for their future. So in this screenshot, my another student, a different student, Fred, we'll call him, um, I asked Fred to set his own goals before an IEP. So these are his own personal goals. And, um, you know, of course it's a little coach because like these are things that we're working on and he knows that it's important for him to be able to listen faster because he's got low vision, his, he gets very bad visual fatigue and he knows he's gotta be able to switch to auditory access before his eyes get very tired and then he's no longer got any usable vision. So for Fred's own goals, he said that he wanted to get to reading 700 words per minute reading speed. He wants um, CAST, Google CAST, to work so that teacher's notes can be broadcast to his laptop. So basically he wants some sort of screen sharing tool that he can use. He wants special glasses for orchestra so he can read the music. And then I asked him, Fred, what, tell, me, tell us what's working at school. And he says, homework, because he can do it on a computer. Text to speech, because he likes the reading speed using voice dream reader. And what's working well is seeing what we do in the classroom. I can see the classwork and I know what to do. I use my computer and I'm close to the board and the smart screen so I can see what I'm doing. So, you know, he, it's very important in that like what's working well at school is when he can see stuff or when he can access things, read things, listen to things. But then it's also, okay, what needs to be improved? Um, something about the app, he wants a better note-taking system. He doesn't want to get his magnifier out because he's too embarrassed and there's not enough room on his desk. Um, he knows he needs to take more vision breaks because his eyes still get tired. And when he's, his eyes are tired, it's um, very difficult to read and see with his eyes. So you can imagine this is like him doing his own evaluation. He's figuring out what's working well, but what can we optimize? What can we improve? And 
this is where we're going to target the instruction because that's what's going to motivate the kid too. So this was Fred's own personal goals and I'm going to I'm going to keep that in mind as I propose my own IEP goals. So based on what Fred identified for himself, my first IEP goal was that um, we were going to figure out some sort of note taking system on a personal computing device with magnification and text to feet text to speech features during class activities and we're going to work on saving and organizing them in a digital notebook. The second goal I wrote for him was that he's going to use a variety of apps on a personal computing device to annotate digital worksheets, um, text notes, calculations, diagrams, because remember he's got uh, that you know visual fatigue is a big issue so he needs a better way to get things magnified because he doesn't want to pull that magnifier out but having things in a digital format is also gonna allow him that auditory access um, to review and study um, when he might be very tired at the end of the day, especially his vision. And then finally, I want Fred to be able to, to describe his visual impairment and identify the accommodations and technology that he needs to efficiently access information in all school environments. So this is part of that self-determination part of the ECC, right? He's gotta identify the accommodations. He's gotta be able to explain to a sub what he needs, why he might have earbuds in there when nobody else does. Um, and what does this look like when a student's able to achieve this goal of describing their visual impairment and identifying the accommodations and technology? I want to show you quickly, I have um, two examples and I'm actually going to skip to the second example, but um, this First example, you can find it on the PASA Technology website. Um, it's a student blogger. He blogs under Pasta Guy, and this is one of my former students. And um, during a 30 minute um, session, he outlined what he was going to email to his new eighth grade teachers. So basically, by eighth or ninth grade, I expect my students to email their teachers, to introduce them to their teachers, and let the teachers know what their accommodations are. and how how the teachers can help facilitate their learning so this is a way for students to empower that gen ed teacher to say hey teacher i'm a low vision kid or i'm a blind kid who's going to be in your classroom don't worry about it because i'm going to be fine but i just need you to help me out and it helps when my materials are in this format and you might see me accessing my work in a different format but it's going to be cool it's going to be great and this is a really nice way for i think the student to set the tone with the teacher but it also models how students need to be their own advocates in college, in the workplace, um, and kind of in general life, right? The students need to be in charge of dictating their access. And of course, I'm gonna follow up with the teachers and make sure they understand everything, and go over the accommodations, but I'm gonna do that behind the scenes because the student really needs to take the lead on um, setting that up with the teacher too, okay? So, and the second example, this is how a student can become her own advocate. This is another student of mine. Um, this is a middle schooler going into high schooler next year. And she just, and she, she drafted this um, email and we worked on it together. So she's gonna send this out to her teachers um, in August. She just says, hello, I'm Emily. I'll be in your class this year. She tells the teacher about her visual impairment. She says, I have trouble seeing the board, but what helps is X, Y, and Z. Due to my visual impairment, this is difficult, text is difficult, but here's what helps. So this format of like identifying difficulty, but giving teachers a solution, I think is very helpful. And it gives those Gen Ed teachers who might not have had a VI student before, it gives them something very specific that they can do. So I think this is a great way for students to feel empowered and for students to help their Gen Ed teachers feel empowered, okay? Um, and, and then, you know, in this email also, she says, you know, I use a MacBook instead of a Chromebook because the display is larger, therefore making it easier to read. It also has many features that make it easier for my low vision and to use text-to-speech if needed. Therefore, I use earbuds to listen to material sometimes. So we basically ran through a scenario where, like, maybe there's a sub who is like, don't, no headphones allowed, and she's got to be able to stand up for herself. Okay, so, um, this was, I know, a super packed uh, presentation. I wanted to leave you guys with resources. Um, there's my accessibility tip sheet um, posted at bit.ly forward slash a11ytips-siu 
these are all going to be these links are all going to be posted on the CSMT website, you guys. Um, so this tip sheet will give you resources for how do I make sure text, images, and video are accessible. There's also a video coming soon about that too. On Perkins Plaza Technology, um, there is a webinar I recorded, a one-hour webinar called Dueling Devices, and it's just another um, kind of introduction to how do I do a needs assessment and how do I assess and justify students' needs for technology. Um, I love the student post section on Perkins Pazit Technology. So if you just go to Pazit Technology and look up student posts, uh, you'll find it. And Pasta Guy's got a couple posts there too. I love his Dear Ms. Teacher post because it shows what an understanding he has of the technology he needs and why. So this post is him basically requesting for an additional or new tech and why he needs more tech. And then finally, Veronica with four eyes, um, www.veronica, spelled with four eyes, dot com. Um, she's a college student who's got low vision. Um, she actually lost her uh, low vision uh, temporarily a couple weeks ago. Um, and she is just awesome. So she's got a great blog post, really speaking from the perspective of a student using this technology um, and how it helps her. So really great breakdown of different things. And, um, and that is it for today, you guys. Um, thank you so much for hanging out. Um, come join me next week if you want. Next week, we're actually going to be talking more about screen sharing tools and strategies. I know that's a, you know, how do my kids access the board is a big deal, less of a big deal now that we're online. But still, um, we'll go through some tools and strategies next week. And then um, on Tuesday, um, June 30th at 3 p.m., we have a special Techie TVI meetup. We we'll invite you guys all to bring your own questions, BYOQ. Um, we'll have some live demos. Jessica McDowell and Neil McKenzie will be joining us, and Neil will be announcing uh, that new website where he'll be sharing his files to help us with our tactile graphics and PI production. Um, so, oh, and my name's Ting. I'm on Twitter at TVI Ting. And for anybody who like wants to nerd out more about this uh, topic, um, I run a Facebook group called Multimedia Accessibility in the Digital Classroom. So thank you so much all for joining me. I hope you have a great rest of the week and hope to see you next week. Sponsored by the California Department of Education Clearinghouse for Specialized Media and Technology. Video editing by Monica Kulana, SF State Program.